It's live. We are live at the pack. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Dawn Sangri. I'm a part of the Sustainability Committee. Yay! Yay! And we have been having a fabulous Earth Day week. I hope you are enjoying it as much as we are. Today, we are going to look at serious stuff. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Beyond Plastics and a little bit about these delightful folks and then we'll give it to them. There will be time afterwards for questions and I hope if you have some you will ask them at the end. All right, so Beyond Plastics is a nationwide project based at Bennington College in Bennington, Vermont that pairs the wisdom and experience of environmental policy experts with the energy and creativity of grassroots advocates to build a vibrant and effective movement to end plastic pollution. Very focused. They were launched in 2019. Their president is a woman named Judith Ink. Judith Ink, as it happens, is going to be honored at Mohawk Mountain House in June. She has been awarded the 2023 Mohawk Consultations Distinguished Achievement Award. And there is a celebration of that at Mohawk on June 11th in the pavilion. And if enough of us wanted to go, we would, we would send a bus. So um, keep your eye open for that. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna read a couple things that they say about Judith so that you have a sense of her work. Um, this is from the consultations committee. We will celebrate Judith's historic efforts to raise awareness of the plastic pollution crisis, work toward elimination of, elimination of single use plastics, block new plastic production facilities, and train a new generation of leaders in the anti-plastics movement. And the folks that are with us today are that people, those people. They are the ones who have been trained to spread the word. Dead Worlds is the daughter of a pioneer woodland couple, the late Pat and Reuben Welsh. So her parents lived here. She is a retired reference librarian with almost 40 years experience helping people locate factual authoritative information and to think critically about it. She served as a town of Rosen Rosendale environmental commissioner for six years and has a deep love and respect for the natural world. She also serves on the board of the John Burroughs Natural Historical Society and is its current vice president. She works to apply her passion and skills to help ensure a future for this planet she loves and for future generations of humans, for all of our children and grandchildren to be able to have a sustainable, healthy life here on Earth. This is why she became involved with the Beyond Plastics organization. Jim Sullivan is a retired Spanish teacher in Rosendale, New York, and a longtime environmental advocate. In the fall of 2022, he took Judith Inc.'s online course about plastic pollution and was shocked to learn about the severe environmental, economic, and health consequences it poses. Since then, he has been motivated to spread the word about the impacts of plastics on our health and on climate change. Jim has an MA in Spanish from Middlebury College and remains active in both community and school organizations. He teaches music lessons and plays in a few local bands, including the New Breaks Bluegrass 
band that was here last week in open rehearsal. So you, last time you saw this band, you had a, either a bass or a banjo. <laughs> Both, yes. And, and he's also doing enough to drive a bus. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to Deb and Jim. Hi, everybody. Thank you very, very, very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Sustainability Committee. Uh, it's good to see so many familiar faces here. Um, being here, I think for both me and Deb, is sort of like being on our home court. We performed here for the first time 13 or 14 years ago. We've had so many really fun and positive experiences right here in this room. We've also been to some powerful memorial services in this room, and what we're going to talk about today is somewhere in between that. So we are affili affiliated with Beyond Plastics, as you know, and they seek to end plastic, plastic pollution. We're here today to talk to you about what we mean when we talk about plastic pollution or the plastic pollution crisis. Uh, stunningly present in today's New York Times and maybe Washington Post. We want to express and talk about what the problem is, what does it affect, why is it happening now, and what we can do to stop it. So a little bit about me more than Dawn said. Like you, I'm sure, I've tried to be environmentally conscious most of my life, and I've been an avid recycler for at least 30 years. During my many years of teaching, I tried to find ways to share my interests and passions with students through music, travel abroad, and participation in a model organization of American States program in Washington, D.C., which was an exercise in, in political stimu simulating the political process on an international level. In recent years, I started to wonder where all the material I was taking to the transfer station was really going and what was happening to it, and sort of poof, Judith Inc. started appearing on Friday mornings on that roundtable program on WNAMC, and she nabbed me. Uh, a little bit more about Deb. It just happens to be me that's up here today. It could be either one of us, and uh, really the main reason I'm here today is because she is such a passionate environmentalist and naturalist, and to be around her is to catch that spirit, um, and that's that. So last fall, I took Judith Hanks Beyond Plastic Pollution class, and in the case of plastic, I've come to learn that the vast majority of plastic is not being recycled at all. Somewhere between 5 and 10 percent at best, and that is very much at the heart of what we're going to discuss today. I have to admit that I've come to feel a little overwhelmed by the full size and scope of the issue. The good news is that there are clear answers to all of the questions. We know what this problem is and where it came from. We know why it is happening now. More importantly, we also know how to fix it. And I'm hoping to raise awareness of the plastic impact of plastic production and consumption on the environment and how to stop it. The issue of plastics affects every person on Earth, if not all living creatures. This picture is one that is discussed in today's Times article and a whole series of them. So stick around and we'll tell you how we can do it and how you're going to help, all right? Before I really get going, the problem of plastics is a big problem and a very serious one. It's a problem we have created and like many challenges and problems, we can solve it. We've removed lead from gasoline. Science has created vaccines for polio, smallpox, mumps, COVID. We've solved many big problems. We've reduced air pollution in the United States by 74% since the passage of the Clean Air Act in 1970. We have vaccines, vaccines for hepatitis A and hepatitis B. We stopped using DDT. And now we have eagles, hawks, and bluebirds again. When I was a child, there weren't any in New York State. We've drastically slowed the incidence and impact of HIV AIDS. We've reduced 
children's exposure to multiple highly toxic pesticides under the Food Quality Protection Act of 1966. In all these cases, the answers were available with effort, and sometimes they were even quite simple. The challenge was to create the political will to find them and implement them. And the same is true for the plastics problem. So is there really a plastic problem? Yes, there is. Today we're gonna to learn about what plastics are, which I didn't know at all before, where they come from and how they impact our environment, climate change, our health, and most importantly, what we can do about it. One of the most amazing aspects of the plastics crisis is how recent it is. Since the 1950s, some of you were alive then, uh, humans have produced approximately 10 billion tons of plastic. Most of it is still with us, and it's easy to see. About 80% of all the litter in the United States is plastic. The problem is so pronounced that there are barely any plastic pollution deniers out there. Moreover, of the nearly 10 billion tons of plastic in existence today, about half was manufactured in the last 15 or 20 years. Just to make it more exciting, 8 to 15 million tons of plastic waste ends up in the oceans every year. And this is a conservative range and based on old data. But even 9 million tons works out to a garbage truck's worth of plastic every minute. Well, let's take a short trip into numbers. I'm gonna to be tossing around the numbers million and billion willy-nilly today and already have. So let's just take a second to try and wrap our heads around the idea of a million and a billion. Can you imagine a million of something? It's not as hard to imagine a million dollars anymore as it used to be. But let's consider what 8 to 15 million tons of plastic going into the ocean every year really means. This picture up here shows one pallet of plastic. That's three and a half feet by four feet by three and a half feet high. This pallet contains about 18,000 16 ounce bottles and weighs about 800 pounds, which is my weight times four on a good day. <laughs> about two and a half pallets is a ton. My quarter ton pickup truck can safely carry about 500 pounds, a little over half a pallet. How are we doing with the, the clips? Because I can't see it over there. There's the pickup truck. 25 pallets equals 10 tons, and this tractor trailer can haul 40 tons or 100 pallets. That's a lot. If we load 10,000 trucks to the hilt, that gets us to 1 million tons. And somewhere between 9 and 15 million tons of plastics goes into the ocean every year. And by the way, I have to review this. A billion is a thousand millions. So we're talking a lot of stuff here. Back to the garbage trucks worth of plastic every minute. At that rate, just two years from now, there will be one pound of plastics for every three pounds of fish in the sea. And by 2050, the ratio will be one to one. And another. We're turning our oceans into a landfill, which is profoundly affecting the more than three billion people who depend on the sea for their livelihood. And of course, all this plastic is not good for sea creatures, which become entangled in or ingest plastic. So it's already gotten pretty dark. And let's take a deep breath and let me introduce you to my granddaughter, Nina. I'm worried about the world we brought her into, but the joy of having her promotes hope. And this is my grandson, Baby Smith, who is due on Mother's Day. We're gonna be talking more about the impact of plastics on their lives and their health as we go along. 
So this uh, slide shows the history of plastic production from 1950 to 2023 and beyond. The human population has tripled since 1950. Plastic production has increased 70-fold, and we're on track to double production by 2050. If you look closely at the graph, you can see that half of all plastic was created just in the last 15 to 20 years. And this is alarming, but it's also grounds for hope. The problem is incredibly recent. Think of where you were in 2005. It isn't hard to imagine a world without this level of plastic. It's also easy to identify how things came to be this way and how to change them. The current plastic crisis is younger than 15 years old. How did things come to be this way? Let's look a little bit at history. Everybody know-ish what that is? Yeah. So the innovations and improvements and mass production of plastic played a major role in the Allied forces' success in World War II. With metals, rubber, and silk in short supply, manufacturers sought to create synthetic materials to replace them across the entire range of military supplies. The plastics in industry really came of age during World War II as corporations geared up to produce the material needed to wage that war. Nylon replaced silk and parachutes. Acrylic or plexiglass made optically perfect windows and enclosures for gunners. Plastics were used for tropical combat boots, rain gear, helmet, liners, plastic film to protect ammunition from water, all kinds of things. Thank you. So plastic producers knew that the post-war period was going to be important for them. They figured out that we needed plastic to not just move into people's homes, but through them. Promoting items that were disposable was almost as important to increasing market share as demonstrating that they were useful in the home. There's a cool thing here I want to make sure you see. You probably remember seeing that. So how did we get from World War II to this? Next time you go to Tops or, to, uh, or ShopRite, just really pay attention as you're going up and down the aisles and see what's there. Even in 1942, Dow was advertising to consumers on the home front about the wonders of what we now call polystyrene. An entire DuPont division worked on prototypes of housewares that could be made of plastics and then produced for the war. Consumers needed to be convinced. In the 1950s, the plastics industry became one of Madison Avenue's biggest clients. They collaborated with women's magazines on special issues dedicated to plastics, and they even sent a 12-page booklet to 12,000 home economics teachers around the country. Soon, plastics became as American as apple pie. I can't speak for everyone here, but I have basically lived much of my life surrounded by plastic, which makes it even difficult for me to recognize it. It's so common we hardly notice it. This picture is from the 1980s. There was some single-use plastic then, but nothing like today. We could easily have the same amount of convenience we have today using other materials, paper, glass, and metal. We haven't always used plastic the way we are these days. The world I grew up in used far less plastic packaging than we do now. So nowadays, no matter how much you care, you can't avoid plastic in your daily life. I had some students at school where I taught actually try to go a week without plastic, and you just can't. It's everywhere. You can avoid the packaging, bring your bags to the store, get your mug filled at the coffee shop, go to the refill stations. By the way, there's a good refill store right in New Paltz now on 32 coming into town. But it's impossible to avoid plastics completely. 
So what is plastic? And what does it have to do with the environment and climate change? A lot. Because 99% of plastics today are manufactured from fossil fuels. Everything you need to know about their creation and their impact stems from there. In the United States, the majority of plastics are manufactured from ethane gas, a byproduct of hydraulic fracturing, or just fracking. You've all heard of fracking, a method of extracting shale gas from deep underground deposits, but you may not know that it yields a cheap byproduct, ethane. Ethane used to be flared off, but nowadays the ethane is, ethane is captured and sent via pipelines to an ethane cracker plant. Ethane molecules are superheated until they crack. Those new molecules are ethylene, which is the base or feedstock of the kind of light plastic used to make single-use items. Ethane cracks, which is a term that just means breaks into something smaller, at 1,650 degrees Fahrenheit, creating ethylene, the basic building block of most plastics. Add pressure and or a catalyst, and you get polyethylene, which is extruded kind of like spaghetti and cut into little pellets. These tiny polyethylene pellets are the feedstock for everything from auto parts to zippers, but especially single-use items. An example, it takes a thousand pellets to make one disposable soda water bottle. This chart tells us what plastic is used for. An estimated 43% of plastic produced today goes to make packaging. The majority of today's plastics are designed to be used only briefly before being discarded. Most virgin plastic now goes into making containers, cups, plastic bags, bottles, straws, forks, plates, vapes. Any vapors out there? Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. An amazing number of things. In addition to ethane, thousands of chemicals are added to Plastic. So turning petroleum, coal, or gas into a plastic fork or any plastic item won't just happen through temperature or pressure. Different chemicals are added for different purposes to increase flexibility or rigidity, to repel water. Dyes are added for colors and messages. Flame retardants do the volatility of the base components. Because there are so many additives to plastic, it makes it nearly impossible to recycle most plastic products. And worse, many of these chemicals are toxic, and they get in our bodies, our air, and our food. And remember this if you can. Plastics are stable, but they are not inert. And this is especially true when they are heated. Please do not eat anything that's cooked or microwaved in plastic. You should have seen Deb jump when I did that once before all of this. When the molecules heat up, the chemical added additives migrate into the food. So how does the presence of plastic in our environment impact our health? It's important to remember that plastic does not break down in the environment. It just breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics. Of course, all these bottles don't remain bottles. Sunlight hastens the breakup, as does the motion of water in the oceans. But it's not just in the oceans. They become microplastics and can be found just about everywhere on Earth. Microplastics have been found on Mount Everest and in the Mariana Trench. They've been found in the air, water, soil, and rainwater. These microplastics have found their way into our food and our bodies. They've been found in snowflakes and in plants. I meant to wear my green woodland pond jacket today, which is a fleece jacket, which I love, and that's fleece. That's fiber made from, from plastic. 
So microplastics are in the food chain and they are inside us. Each week it's estimated that everyone, everywhere in the world, it's hard to believe, but it's pretty true, drinks or inhales five grams of plastic, which is the equivalent to a credit card, 52 times a year, me and you. The question is, is ingesting microplastics bad for us? <laughs> Researchers have only begun really looking into this. Remember, it's a new problem, and research takes time and money. But we do know for sure that many of the chemicals used to make plastics are indeed quite dangerous. Remember, plastic is made from fossil fuels and chemicals. It's the added chemicals that give plastics many of their useful attributes, the flexibility, rigidity, or heat resistance. Okay, this is our basic um, plastic polymer. These chemicals do not bond to what wonderfully strong, to the wonderfully strong carbon molecule, those black and gray things. They sit between the folds, kind of floating around, and they don't stay put. They find their way into us. Among them are bisphenols and phthalates. These chemicals, in addition to the plastics themselves, are known to cause a variety of health problems. Another thing to think about regarding the building blocks of plastic is that fossil fuels are highly flammable. What is it that keeps our fleece jackets, Legos, glasses, frames, rain boots, carpets, and couches from bursting into flame. Flame retardants. Many of the chemicals in flame retardants are endocrine disruptors, which trick the body into thinking that they are hormones. Under normal circumstances, hormones carry messages that act like on-off switches. Their presence in our bodies is like a dance that is very carefully timed. Endocrine disruptors upset this dance, even in very low doses, and they affect important systems all over the body. These chemicals are endocrine disrupting compounds, or EDCs, which can affect necessary systems all over the body. EDCs can impact the hormones that regulate our appetite and metabolism, causing obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. EDCs can disrupt brain development, causing lower IQ, ADHD and autism spectrum disorders. EDCs can cause cancers, especially breast, prostate, and testicular cancers, all of which are on the uptick. So remember these tiny beads of plastic resin? Did I skip a, did you skip a head one? Okay, good. Well, you can see them up there. Those little tiny beads are called nurdles. Nurdles are present in large quantities in the oceans more than 250,000 tons of nurdles end up in the oceans every year. And they're found inside the fish, the seabirds, turtles, and other wildlife that mistake these tiny pellets for food. When you go beachcombing, you can often find them there as well. Microplastics in general are present everywhere in the oceans and commonly found in fish and birds. But back for a minute to where plastic is made. Ethane crackers are extremely complex. They rank among the largest, most expensive, and most energy intensive facilities in the process and manufacturing sectors. This is a shell, this is Shell Polymers Monica, a new ethane cracker facility that just started operating last fall. This giant petrochemical complex covers 386 acres atop the Marcellus Shale on the Ohio River in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, about 30 miles northwest of Pittsburgh. It can produce 1.6 million metric tons of polyethylene pellets a year. It's fed by pipelines stretching hundreds of miles across Appalachia and has its own rail system. At its heart is an ethane cracker with seven furnaces, 200 vessels, 95 miles of pipe. Three other units on the site process the cracked ethane into polyethylene and then into pellets. We learned from a state impact study in 2022 that in the first two months of its operation, the plant exceeded its allotted limit of toxic emissions for the entire year. But new cracker plants aren't coming just to Western Pennsylvania. 
This map shows new petrochemical and plastic infrastructure projects or expansions approved already or announced since 2012. At least 90 such proposals have been advanced over the last decade, including 42 major construction projects. So why do we think the oil and gas industry is betting so heavily on plastics? The increasing popularity of electric cars and renewable energy are reducing the demand for fossil fuels. <clears throat> Good thing. According to the International Energy Agency, <clears throat> renewals are set to overtake coal and become the world's largest source of electricity by 2025. Yay! Yay, two years. <coughs> to hedge their bets, the fossil fuel industry <clears throat> is ramping up plastic production. This is their plan B. But plastic is not carbon neutral. Plastic generates greenhouse gases at every stage of its life cycle. Over 1 billion metric tons, B with a B, B billion metric tons of CO2 equivalent. <clears throat> Cracking alone requires huge amounts of power. The new Shell plant has a permit that allows it to admit as much carbon dioxide annually as 480,000 cars. The expansion plan by the industry could account for 15% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, which would make us miss our Paris goals of cutting emissions in half by 2030. If all those new crackers go into operation, it will threaten humankind's ability to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Because big corporations don't just walk away, from multi-billion dollar investments. Building this cracker plant costs $6 billion, and fossil fuel companies don't want to wind up with stranded assets. So what about recycling? How do we solve this? The iconic recycling symbol was created in 1970 by 23-year-old architecture student Gary Anderson for a design competition. 18 years later, <clears throat> the Society of the Plastics Industry appropriated the three chasing arrows for their resin identification system, <clears throat> an ingenious marketing move because it suggested that any item with the symbol could be recycled. In fact, one, two, and five are the only ones you can melt down and reconstitute. <clears throat> we see these brochures all around Ulster and Sullivan counties, encouraging us to recycle, and pretty much saying all plastic can be recycled. The difference between can be and will be is enormous and very important. No matter what your community or waste hauler tells you, only number one, polyethylene terephthalate bottles, and number two, high-density polyethylene bottles and jugs, and possibly, but not likely, polypropylene number five containers have a realistic chance of getting recycled. That's because they're the only types of post-consumer plastic for which there's a market. There's a lot of slick marketing going on right now to promote plastic recycling. A lot of it just isn't true. Paper, glass, cardboard, and metal? Absolutely. And truthfully, even if only a small percentage of plastic gets recycled, 9% of 10 million tons is a lot. By 2023, the Society of the Plastics Industry appropriated, excuse me, uh, in 2023, the American Society for Testing and Materials, ASTM, was in charge of administrating the system of identification and recognizing that consumers, like me for sure, were confused by the symbol they revised the graphic a little. Most of us remain convinced that any of these codes mean an item is recyclable. They don't mean they're recyclable. They just indicate the type of plastic resin that's used to make the plastic. And if you're like me a couple of years ago, 
you put just about anything made of plastic into the recycling bin, hoping it will get recycled. Wrong. To be clear, even number one and number two plastics aren't recycled into new bottles and jugs. Instead, they're allowed largely downcycled into carpeting, some benches, storage containers, fleece fabric, lots of other things. For most plastic products, it's just cheaper to buy virgin plastic because, this is the slide I was thinking we were gonna see earlier, polyethylene pellets are so inexpensive to produce. No one is gonna use recycled plastic if they're losing money on it. And why is so much plastic being produced now? The deal is we've been swamboozled for a long time with clever but deeply dishonest advertising and publicity so that the plastics industry can keep making a whole ton of money. This topic could easily be a whole new presentation by itself. And as a matter of fact, it is. This slide is from a short video. We've been convinced that plastic products are wonderful, cheap, and disposable. Larry Thomas, the president of the Society of Plastics Industry until 2019 said it best. If the public thinks that recycling is working, then they're not going to be as concerned about the environment. So remember, this is the recycling symbol created in 1970, and this is a resin identification code created by the plastics industry in 1988 to trick people into thinking plastic was recyclable and therefore maybe okay for the environment. We can't recycle our way out of this problem. It would be nice, but we need to push past that idea. For starters, there's simply too much volume. But more importantly, while recycling of conventional materials such as glass, metal, and paper is effective, the chemistry of many plastics prevents them from being reconstituted. And frankly, the history of plastics recycling is not on our side. So what can we do? Don't blame yourself. The plastics crisis is not your fault or my fault. As you've seen, the plastics problem is a structural problem that is so pervasive that many of us don't even notice it. We can't buy or shop our way out of this. We have to take more upstream action, legislation. We have to take effective action, and your voice is louder than your dollar. You have been led to believe that we don't need to go upstream, but here is the actual solution. Stop making plastic. The more we speak up, tell corporations what you think of their packaging, or write letters to the editor demanding change, the more effective you will be. A problem of this magnitude requires structural change. I'm looking for my false solutions slide. There it was. So the more we speak up, I think I read that already. Um, let's go to turn off the tap. <laughs> where, did my, where did false solutions go? Anyway, if the tub or the sink is overflowing in your kitchen here at Woodland Pond, you don't start cleaning. Has that ever happened here? <laughs> if you don't start cleaning it up, you don't start cleaning it up until you stop the flow of water. First thing you do is turn off the tap. And since 43% of plastic produced today goes to make packaging, that's where we need to focus. Not through our own behavior and personal choices, but through policy change. The news here is good. We've already, we already have the political will to achieve this. You're here. People all over the planet are overwhelmed by the problem and looking for solutions. Polling conducted by Data for Progress in February of 2023 found that 78% of voters reported being somewhat concerned or very concerned about the impact of plastic pollution on the environment and oceans. 69% supported a ban on single-use plastics in their communities. 82% resoundingly backed goals supported in extended producer responsibility legislation. It's also known as EPR, such as reducing or capping plastic production setting durability standards for plastics, 
and implementing, eco implementing eco-friendly waste management systems. This means that it's time to organize, which is something that Beyond Plastics is very good at. There are a lot of regulations that can be used to achieve this. Some are federal, some are global treaties, but some are simple town ordinances, ordinances that can be passed and enacted very close to home. These changes are based on the same fundamental principle you just heard mentioned, which is called extended producer responsibility. In a nutshell, you make it, you take it. Right here in the Pulse, in Elster County, I think we've enacted plastic bag bans, straw bans. It's, you know, it's really can start locally. Currently, there are two bills on the table in New York State that are under, underpinned by EPR, the Extended Packaging Reduction Concept. One sponsored by Senator Rachel May of Central New York and another by Senator Harcum in Peekskill that are based on the Beyond Plastics model. Let's have a closer look at some of the key ideas and then you can let your state senator know from the handout we're going to give you in just a minute um, some of the key ideas and, and that you expect them to support these bills. Reduce packaging by 50% in 10 years and make the rest recyclable. The chemical additives that go into plastics in the first place should not be toxic and harmful to our health. Disposal methods that involve burning, whether it is in open pits or waste to energy incinerators, are untenably toxic and must be halted, and so on. I don't think we're aware here that right in Poughkeepsie and um, Peak Skill, we have incinerators that burn plastic, and a lot of the plastic that we take to the recycling center gets purchased and taken there and burned. On a national level, the Break Free from Plastics Act is awaiting action. And you can see here what the Break Free from Plastic Act can accomplish. But we believe that local action can do the most to get things going, just like what you are doing here at Woodland Pond with the Sustainability Committee. You can help push for policy change. Start by joining the Beyond Plastics mailing list. All you gotta do is read your email. Take a class, take the Beyond Plastics class that Deb and I took with Judith Think. She's a rock star by now, and we just heard that she got that award today. And if you audit the class, it's $100 very well spent. And to really make an impact, join our local groups and affiliates program. There are currently 82 groups nationwide, and there's one right here in New Paltz that you can join, and that group is on fire right now. So to help get you started, Beyond Plastics also offers free online training sessions. It's four hours over two days, and you can mix and match whichever time slots work for you. The next series will be held in May. And here's the fun part. Consider joining me. It's been approved that I can drive the bus to ride to Albany on Tuesday, May 2nd for a rally in Albany. This rally is to promote the current bills that are on the table in New York State for this year. The two that you saw previously. Um, Jason's already in, it's been approved, so you'll be hearing more information about when to sign up for that. And please follow us on the social media of your choice. On behalf of Beyond Plastics here at New Paltz, and Deb and me, thanks so much for listening. If there are any questions, I'm gonna ask Deb to answer them. <laughs> she, she knows a lot more than I do. Is there any solution to the pollution that now exists in the ocean? Uh, geez, I just read an article yesterday about it. The, the, there, are, there are ways to create fungi that can eat it and create a material that can be used to something, to, you know, to create something new, but the, the size of it is, is problematic. Uh, and there are people thinking about that problem. But I think the- They're experimenting a lot with bacteria. There are bacteria that can eat plastic. There are bacteria that can digest plastic, but as yet, we're not certain. Deb, what's, what's the plastic 
thing called in the Pacific Ocean? Oh, the gyre. There's a plastic garbage patch. Garbage the gyres. Garbage. Yeah, that's it's twice there. the size of Texas. Yeah. There's it's one big. in the Atlantic. There are, there are multiple uh, <laughs> floating gyres of plastic in the ocean, unfortunately. And it's not like the garbage trucks are dumping trash directly into the ocean. It oftentimes gets into streams and waterways from some of the Southeast Asian countries. We, we put it in these nice pallets, all neatly wrapped up where it's not blowing around, and it gets delivered, it gets purchased and delivered and exported to some Southeast Asian countries, primarily Turkey, Vietnam. Um, there are about 10 major importers of plastic trash. And they don't have the means to take care of it. It gets into the, the streams and rivers and washes out to sea. And those myrtles go everywhere. <laughs> yes. Question. Yeah, oh, wait a minute. There was one back here. <laughs> yes. I, I stole her microphone. Did you have a question? I think she does. Yeah, she does. Yeah. yeah. She has a question. You can go. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, doesn't the medical industry use tons of plastic in their work to wonder how you they do talk um, to them about it? You know, I hope you got from this presentation that plastic has a lot of great uses. It really does, um, and we count on it. It helps us in a lot of ways, especially in, in medicine, but you also may recall that that was a pretty small percentage of the plastic that's produced, and a lot of work could be done to make that plastic reusable and recyclable that's not being done now. But yeah, it's mostly, uh, the, the packaging is mostly like those, the, the cellophane clamshells that our fruit gets cut up into. We've, We've been convinced that we need a culture of convenience, and, and that part we are a little responsible for. You can buy a cantaloupe. It comes in its own natural biodegradable packaging. It's called a rind, and you can peel it. Um, so some of that we are responsible for. But yeah, it's, it's remarkable how you wouldn't know fruit comes with skin or a rind that is removable and biodegradable. I'm gonna let Don handle the microphone now. Um, I don't understand why these Southeast Asian countries are buying our garbage if they are dumping it. I mean, they're spending money to buy it and, and then they throw it in the ocean, let's say. Why is that happening? It seems to me that's counterintuitive. Yes, uh, I wish I understood why that happens. Um, but some places do incinerate, uh, they incinerate it, they use it for fuel. If they don't have dung or coal or petroleum, it is petroleum. It's petroleum, it's fuel. And they buy it and burn it, um, but it just builds up in huge numbers. I don't remember if it was three years or four years ago. We used to export millions and millions of tons to China, but China said, yeah, two questions. One of them uh, is the act that to make the producers responsible to taking the plastic back. That doesn't seem to address the problem because the plastic is still there. What are they doing with it? So that's kind of like, yeah, just take it off my yard, but you deal with it. So it's, it sends a signal but I don't think that from a practical point of view it resolves too much. And the other thing with the packaging, I think you know, there is issues of convenience and you pointed in the medical industry, but I think even in the medical industry, there is quite a bit of abuse of plastics. Just to give you an example, my wife now gets two drops, one on each eye, twice a day, each two drops comes in a plastic container. Each two drops, okay? So I mean, I'm sure that there is plenty of room to make things better. Yeah, um, as far as the Break Free for Plastic Pollution Act, they are incentivizing good design. The, the notion is to work with plastic producers. This isn't, you know, the intention isn't to be hostile. Uh, it's to turn off the tap. So the more we can incentivize and get them, if, if they have to pay and deal with the waste, and that 
it isn't all just profit, they will probably reduce their production. And, and a little more on that is that the product that itself, if you don't color it or put a label on it with a chemical and you keep it clean, it can, it can be possibly recycled and used again. And we need to legislate and make that something that companies are forced economically to do. Yeah, that, that's a point that could be underscored. We could re we could be recycling a lot more plastic. We could be using recyclable plastic in a form where they can be recycled. And you know, like glass, metal, and paper, that can be recycled indefinitely, like to like, from paper to paper, from bottle to bottle, from can to can. But as Jim pointed out, plastics often get downcycled from a plastic drinking water bottle to a, a carpet. I have a question about the role of water and the problem with the use of water because um, certain items that are supposed to be recyclable have to be washed. washed. And I know that could be a year ago, two years ago now, other people who are experienced in the whole recycling thing, there was a split there. Don't bother to recycle this because it's it's counterintuitive. You're using up so much water to do, to clean, and I myself, my house that I came from, had a hand dug well right over here in the Shondams. and when I was trying to clean something so it could be recycled, I mean I just hated. I'm thinking of every drop of water that's coming out of my hand dug well. So any anything you can say about water and recycling? Well, I... Comment and say. Uh, what, wash it or don't? No, that's well, it is a very good point. Um, however, a lot of the reason that recycling is made more difficult is if materials are are contaminated and it will cross-contaminate loads and, there, and it creates biohazard. So if you put something dirty into the recycling, it really does waste that, that potential to reuse that material. So, but the, the other water consideration is in the processing of the plastic at the get-go because it's made from hydraulic fracturing um, and each individual hydraulic fracturing well requires over, what, a million gallons of water? <laughs> Uh, a million a day, maybe a million a day. It, it requires an outrageous amount of water to do a hydraulic fracturing well, which is where the ethane, that's the feedstock, comes from. And that's that should be of concern, especially in areas that are experiencing drought. Um, but yeah, it, it's unfortunate. Yeah, I wash I wash my recyclables, and I do encourage you all your ones and twos keep recycling them. Do recycle what you can. If we recycle 5% until we can get some of this legislation passed, it's better than nothing. It's, it's 5 to 8 million, and that's just, the 5 to 8 million metric tons is just what goes in the ocean. The rest of it gets incinerated and buried. So the less plastic we can use and the more that we can recycle what is recyclable, the better. That, that cracker plant, the new one in Pennsylvania, that plant produces 150 metric tons of plastic pellets a year. Mm. So it's, if you just look at one of our grocery stores, remember that there are 60,000 grocery stores in the United States. That doesn't include Home Depot and Tractor Barn. And every, those stores are just full of plastic. It's a, it's a monster, it's just a really large problem. Does microwaving take out food, fast food, the way people live nowadays? Doesn't that contribute to people's lifestyles? Yes, it has. And um, we do hope people will reconsider for their own health and well being, even if they purchase things in plastic. Put, before you put it in your microwave, transfer it to a ceramic or glass container because um, as Jim explained, some of those free chemicals that are sitting in the folds of those carbon molecules will migrate into your food. Mm -hmm. 
and some of them have, can really be um, bad for your health. Did that answer your question? Um, but, uh, were you just mostly talking about lifestyle changes that we don't? Yeah, that, that's an astute comment because yes, we all, we all, we can't really get away from it. Here in Ulster County, we banned polystyrene, the styrofoam containers. So you should not be getting those when you do takeout. If you are, you need to let somebody know so that we can enforce that law. That's a local law. Uh, Deb, if I understood, uh, oh, you and Jim, excuse me, oh, oh. somebody else has to come. Oh my oh, God, you were there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my question is, when plastic is changed or converted, recycled, does that mean the removal of the unwanted element, or you have an entirely new product where there is no unwanted element as residue? Do you, do you understand the question? Yes. Uh, yes, I understand it. I am not a hundred percent sure. I know that they they do sometimes strip chemicals out of the plastics before they recycle. They do indeed, and, and it's complex and requires a lot of chemicals to do that, to remove the chemicals from the plastic. It is a complicated and expensive process. So it's not done very often, but it can be done. It's called chemical recycling, I think, but it's not cost effective and you can't make money doing it. So mostly they downcycle all of that stuff. So they, they, they just, they make a bench out of that plastic and, and still have the plastic. <laughs> uh, Deb and Jim, if I understood you to say that you recycle one and two, what do you do with the others? Do you throw them into garbage? Because here we're recycling all of them, as I understand. One way or the other, the plastic clamshells will probably end up being landfilled or burned, whether you send them to the Resource Recovery Agency and they sort it there and send it to a uh, waste to fuel plant, the Wheel of Raider and Peekskill, or the Dutchess County Resource Recovery Agency has an incinerator, um, or the landfills like up in Seneca Falls is where most of our landfill waste goes. So to clarify, we're, we're recycling most of them, not just one and two. Yes, um, and I think there was it's it's getting separated out at the facilities where the plastic yeah. goes. Yeah. One, the only things that are physically, mechanically being recycled are one, ones and twos, and two, and sometimes five. So there are some places in the country the, that can that can modify the PP to number five, but there's just not very many of them. Just to, to just to make it bad, more, more bad news, <laughs> a very small percentage of the ones and twos get recycled. Most of it goes to the landfill. You mentioned the, the fossil fuel industry uh, and they, their plan B, since uh, there's trying supposedly to reduce coal and oil and the gas production, which they aren't. Uh, but to move on to plastics. And that is a huge, powerful industry with enormous lobbying capacity. At the Stockholm Conference of the Plastic, the, 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 the uh, industry as a whole, the fossil fuel industry, had more representatives than any of the countries there. This is a huge, huge level. Can you speak to what's being done or trying to be done at that upper, upper level? Um, there, there is a lot of lobbying and there's also a lot of public greenwashing going on. Um, I myself, have, I use Facebook, I, how many of you, do some of you use Facebook? Well, I, I got a little notice asking me to oppose the state senate bill, uh, the EPR bill, which is number 4246, which is one of the things we're supporting when we go to Albany on the second. And it was from the American Chemical Council and the verbiage um, said something like, um, this, this bill will cause there not to be any recycling. The Harcum bill, Senator Harcum's bill, which has been supported by Beyond Plastic, uh, it's the one. Uh, the, the, well, 
yes, the third column, it's, it's the best, it's, it's a model, and if it goes through in New York State, it will be a model for the nation in how to do extended producer responsibility. But they are, they are out there and they have this clickable thing and they say, oh, you know, if you don't wanna make recycling less effective in New York, oppose this bill, click here, uh, to let your senator know to oppose this bill. Mm -hmm. But it's coming from the source. It's coming from the source of the plastic pollution. And most people might not recognize that. So just be aware if you see something that says oppose 4246, check out who it's from. If it's the American Chemical Council, um, they are not on your side. <laughs> I, I think this is the last question. Could you speak to what some of the alternatives are in terms of packaging? I mean, I have happened to say to somebody at dinner last night that it's so absurd because my recycling bin, which is a tall garbage can, by the time Friday comes around, I have it completely filled up with packaging and it isn't just plastic, it's the cereal boxes, a lot of paper, and and of course there's metal, but what are the alternatives in terms of things that come in like the clamshell? Are there, uh, are there alternatives? Because I think it would be helpful to people to understand that they could do this instead of that, but maybe there aren't. Right, there are some, one of the ones that Jim spoke about was trying to purchase things in bulk where you can at the health food center, you can bring your own container, even if it's a plastic container that you reuse. I mean, plastic isn't always horrible, horrible, horrible. Just don't heat it up and don't put like fatty and acidic foods in it, but you can use it as a storage container. You can go get your lentils or whatever in, a, in your reusable plastic container. Um, and use it over and over again. And that would at least justify its existence somewhat. Uh, but as far as takeout and things like that, we have a long way to go. And we really need to, we need to regulate how this happens because businesses are not going to take it upon themselves. And, and um, we can also work on subsidizing small businesses with help if they can't afford the packaging. It's not necessarily more expensive. There's a lot of development going on. There's a lot of research and development. And the more these things come to the fore and the more people ask for it, you know, if we start, I, I, call, I call companies, I, I call corporations, I email them and I say, why are you, you used to have a paper bag. Why is it now plastic? Yeah. And and you know, ask them, ask them if they hear from consumers. You don't like this. This stuff stays around for 500 years. I want something that will biodegrade. They react to consumers. As individuals, there's a lot we can do, but it's so small. Um, I'm stuck. I'm I'm going to recycle no matter what. I do some crazy things. I never throw a plastic garbage bag away. I empty it into the container at the dump and I take the plastic bag back home and use yeah, it again until it gets so stinky that I, but, you know, some of the other steps of calling corporations, communicating with stores that, you know, I just want to buy some strawberries here. I don't want to have to buy a clamshell with it. Can, I, can you put a bin out and I'll put them in a bag myself? We used to come in these green cardboard press paper to ask the supermarket, ask if, if 50 people go to the New Paul ShopRite and say, why, is my, why are my strawberries in a plastic clamshell that's going to be here for 500 years? What happened to those press board paper containers? You know, maybe put a little netting over it. You, know, um, you said that like what happened to New York years ago, or did we were attracted to, like you're saying, before they could change the of course, of course they can. They can change the packaging. We, we did very well with paper, metal, and glass for, for decades. I mean, this is a recent problem, as Jim said. It's only the last 20 years it's really 
escalated. So, you know, it's time to turn off the tap. Time to turn off the tap. And go maybe to the taps. Right here. Cheer up a little bit in happy hour. Yeah. I, One last uh, thing though. One last thing. This, this has lots of websites on it. If you email me or Deb, we'll email you this so you just have to click. And you don't have to be typing in different Next things. time, print it on the other side. Use, use paper on the other side. We will. Um, we could, you mean put more text? Like tell? No, no. <laughs> no we need to use Oh, that's it's already been used. Yes. Yeah. 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 Good yeah. Good. Yeah. We're going to go this way from here. So, I want, I want to let you go, and I want to thank, I want us to take a chance to take an opportunity and thank Ben and Jim for being wonderful. And, and you are all invited to happy hour at 3.30 to cheer up. Drinks yeah, on the door, it's all it's all on. Don't think about this stuff all the time. Think about it in, in the middle of the